You know, I was thinking this week, I especially love preaching on Christmas. You would think it's the same story every single year, and then we take multiple weeks, like we have at least four Sundays of different Christmas messages. But I'll tell you what, there's all kinds of different ways to break down the glory and the joy that's found in the Christmas story, and I absolutely love digging into God's Word and where we are at this morning. That video that just played, I loved how it pointed out the specialness of Christmas Eve, the night before Christmas. And how many of you would agree there's, there's nothing quite like the night before Christmas? I mean, how many of you would agree with that fact right there? One thing I know to be true is this. You know that poem, "'Twas the night before Christmas, and all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse." That's the furthest thing from the truth ever. If you've had kids, how many of you agree getting your kids to go to sleep on Christmas Eve is a job in and of itself right there, okay? So if you got kids just trying to get them settled down and trying to get them to sleep is a chore, and then as soon as they get into bed, the real work starts, right? I mean, then you got to get everything out, and you got to get everything set up and ready for the next morning, and then if you're lucky, I think the only thing that's true in that entire poem is that you might get to lay down for a long winter's nap. It's not a night of sleep. You might get a little bit of a nap that night, right? And then, man, sometimes you like get your kids to bed. Have any of you had Christmas at like 2.30 or 3 a.m. because your kids are just wide awake and they're ready to go? Anybody's done that before? Raise your hand. Let me see you. Okay, one time as a kid, we had like Christmas in the middle of the night. My parents just got done getting everything out and we woke up. We're like, is it morning? And they're like, sure, let's just do this right now. And uh, a few years ago, I remember these three boys right here, they were all in the same room. You know, they go to bed after they go to sleep, the stockings up here and all of that stuff. And I remember hearing like noise at three o'clock in the morning and I go to the room, the light is on, they're wide awake and they're like, dad, check it out. I got Kobe Bryant or I got LeBron James. You know, that's back when they were getting the basketball cards, they're wide awake. And I was like, y'all really just need to go back to sleep right now. And uh, so you know what I'm talking about. There's something about that night that is so long, but at the same time, there's something about that night that is so special and so magical, even knowing the joy that's going to come in the morning. The title of our message this morning is this, Don't Miss the Wonder of Joy. Don't Miss the Wonder of Joy. We're in Isaiah chapter 9. We are approximately 700 years before the very first Christmas, and the nation of Israel was experiencing not just a a long, dark night, but they're experiencing one of those long, frozen winters of life. I mean, they were living in darkness. They were without hope. Everywhere they looked, all, all they could see was trouble and problems. They, they were living hopelessly. And then all of a sudden, in the midst of all of that, Jesus appears. And can I tell you this morning, where there is Jesus, there is joy. Let me say that one more time. Where there is Jesus, there is joy. What I love about the passage that we're looking at today is the fact that true joy does not ignore the pain of life. I know everybody's different this year. Some of you might be as nostalgic and as excited about Christmas as you've ever been. Some of you might be feeling a little bit heavy about Christmas just because of life and the way that things have played out. True joy does not ignore the pain of life. Do you know what true joy is? True, true joy is trusting Jesus, is seeing Jesus even in the midst of our, our pain and in the midst of our trouble and trusting God's plan even in the midst of the worst that life has to offer. That's what we're going to see here in Isaiah chapter 9. So I have a question for you this morning before we dive in. Do you have the joy, 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 joy down in your heart? There, okay, some of you right there. For whatever reason, as I'm going through this, that song has been going through my mind all week long. I was going back to junior church. I was going back into the days of doing kids' chapel and singing that song over and over again. And you know what I, you know what I love about what, what your kids are learning in junior church and what they learn in school chapel and different places that, that they go? The simple truths of the songs that they sing are so profound, uh, that song even, it's simple. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart, down in my heart, down in my heart, where I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. And then it says, down in my heart to what? To stay. And then it trans transitions, and I'm so happy, so very happy, because Christmas is going to be awesome this year, right? And I'm so happy because everything in life is perfect, no, I'm so happy because I have the love of Jesus in my heart. 
And that's not going to ever change, and that's not going to ever go anywhere. That's what we're talking about this morning. If you've got Jesus, everywhere you look, you'll see him. And everywhere you see Jesus, you'll see joy. Hey, if you look at your past, and you look at your troubled circumstances, you know what? If you see Jesus, you'll find joy. If, if you look at today and the, and the problems that you're faced with and you see Jesus, you know what you're going to find? Joy. If you start thinking about your future and you start thinking about tomorrow and you see Jesus, you know what you're going to find? Joy. Everywhere we turn, everywhere we look, if we find Jesus, we find the answer that we're looking for, the answers that we're searching for in life, and you're going to find the joy. This morning, don't miss the wonder of joy. And one more thing before we jump into it. And if the devil doesn't like it, he can sit on a bomb. <laughs> I don't know. They change that up sometimes. It's a tack. Some people sing bomb, whatever the case may be. But you get the idea right there. Do you have the joy of Jesus in your heart? Let's, let's just dive right into it. Here's the first thing that I want us to look at this morning. Don't miss the joy of yesterday. Don't miss the joy of yesterday. We're in Isaiah chapter 9. And uh, it's almost the same context of where we were last week. And I, in Isaiah chapter 7, two weeks ago, we were looking at the fact that the nation of Judah was faced with a Syrian and a northern Israel alliance. And they were coming into the country. They were after Jerusalem, and they were coming in to defeat them. And God shows up to King Ahaz, and he gives Ahaz a chance to place his trust in God. But Ahaz, being the foolish man that he was, says, no, I got this all figured out. And he sold his soul to the devil. And he made a pact, he made a, an alliance with the Assyrians, and he paid them all the money from the temple to come in there and overthrow the other enemy armies, which the Assyrians never had to do because God took care of the threat all on his own. Well, here we are, we're just two chapters later. Ahaz is still the king, and now Israel is faced with an imminent Assyrian invasion. Uh, Syria and northern Israel, they're gone, they're out of the country, but now it's the Assyrians that they're dealing with. And if you look actually at... Um, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 22, the last verse of chapter 8, right before you get into chapter 9. Everybody look what it says there. It says this, And they shall look unto the earth, and behold trouble and darkness, dimness of anguish, and they shall be driven to darkness. The whole image of the way that chapter 8 ends is one of intense anguish. It's as dark and stormy as you can get. You know those, those afternoon thunderstorms? You know when the, when the sky just changes and it gets dark and you just can go outside and you feel the electricity that's in the air? It's just like something ominous is about to happen. Something dark is about to happen. That, that's, that's the whole idea. These, these people are, they literally are in the middle of a hurricane of God's justice. That's not where we want to find ourselves. I mean, everywhere they look, it's darkness, it's gloominess. They've got an enemy that's on their doorsteps. But then everybody look at chapter 9 and verse 1, and what is the very first word in verse 1? Everybody out loud together, what is that word? It says, nevertheless. <laughs> nevertheless, what a word. Nevertheless is God's grace. Nevertheless is God's mercy. Although you deserve this gloom, although you deserve this darkness, it's because of their own rebellion. They've put themselves in this situation. You know what God says? Glory is on the way. Something better is coming. Something great is about to happen. So let's look at verse one. Look what it says. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation. When at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. How many of you are wondering what in the world is that verse talking about? All right, so you got Zebulun and Naphtali. Zebulun and Naphtali, they're OGs, okay? They're, they're part of the original 12 tribes of Israel. And years before, right after Solomon's reign, under his son Rehoboam, the, the kingdom of Israel split into two, and you had the northern tribes and you had the southern kingdom. Well, Zebulun and Naphtali stayed a part of the northern tribe. And if you understand the geography of the land of Israel, they were a border nation. And they were in the region of Galilee. Years ago, I had the opportunity to go to Israel, and it was awesome. While we were in Galilee, it's still a border nation to this day. And just on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, there's these hills. And they actually took us up there to a, um, to a military post that's still up there. Not a lot of people live up there, but the idea was back in this time... 
The Assyrians actually came over those hills and they came into the borders of Israel. They came into the land of Zebulun and Naphtali, into the region of Galilee, and they killed thousands of people and they took thousands of people captive. And at the point where Isaiah 9 verse 1 is being written, Zebulun and Naphtali, they were already, um, part, they were already an Assyrian province. They were already conquered. They were already taken over. So just put yourselves in that situation. They've They've lost loved ones. They are under the worst kind of oppression that's imaginable. And you know what God's telling them in verse (laughs) 1? This is so good. Zebulun and Naphtali, you know that affliction that you're feeling now? Imagine that intense pain. He says it's only light affliction compared to the grievous affliction, the heavy affliction of not pain but of glory and honor that's about to come your way. Now here's a question. How many of you this morning would love to be afflicted with honor and glory? How many of you think that's an affliction that I can handle right there? That's what what God's talking about here. What you're experiencing is light compared to the heavy affliction of glory and honor. And by the way, it can happen to you just like it happens to to them back then. Look at verse 2. Here's what's about to happen. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shine. Let's just cut to the chase, okay? I just want to go, this is a prophecy. Isaiah is looking 700 years into the future when Jesus comes. And if you go to Matthew chapter 4, you don't have to turn there right now, but you can write this down, you can reference it. Go look it up for yourself later. Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 17. That's where the prophecy was fulfilled. It's incredible. Jesus just had been baptized, and he had just experienced the temptation of the devil in the wilderness, and he's just beginning his earthly ministry. At the same time, John the Baptist is arrested, and when Jesus found out that John the Baptist was arrested, Matthew takes great care to point out the fact that Jesus left Nazareth, and he went into the land of Galilee, and it says specifically, into the land of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that it might be fulfilled, which the prophet Isaiah said... They that sat in darkness saw a great light. That's what's happening and what's taking place here. All right, I want you to turn off all the lights. Make it completely dark in here. I just I want you to feel the picture of what we're talking about. Can I tell you this morning that apart from Christ, this is what our lives are. They're darkness. Put yourselves in the position, just imagine if you were living at the time of Isaiah chapter 9 and your family had been killed or your family had been taken captives and you're living under the worst type of oppression that you could possibly imagine. And everywhere you look, there's just hopelessness. I love what Andrew pointed out a little bit ago this morning when he was talking about how the angels appeared um, to those shepherds. Same idea. In the land of Naphtali and Zebulun at the time of Christ, those people were a forgotten people. They were despised. They were looked down upon, especially by the religious elite in Jerusalem. These were people that were living in spiritual darkness. You know, they they had a spiritual side. They're turning to to soothsayers, and they're turning to wizardry, and they're, they're looking anywhere for hope and for answers. They are completely lost in darkness. And then suddenly, go ahead, put the Christmas lights on. Suddenly, they that sat in darkness saw great light. At the time of Jesus, you know what Luke says that he begins his ministry? He shows up in Galilee. You know what he's doing? He's preaching the gospel of good news. He's healing the sick. He's causing the blind to see. He's healing the brokenhearted. Hey, he's doing miracles. He brings the dead back to life. Miracle after miracle after miracle. And these people who were living in darkness with absolutely no hope at all, all of a sudden are being filled with hope and with joy and with anticipation that maybe, just maybe something better could come. Isn't this beautiful? Don't, by the way, how many of you just love the Christmas lights? And I'm not just talking about here, but like, do you ever just sit in your house at night in the darkness and just all that's on is the Christmas lights and you're just like, wow. I want to challenge, worship in those moments. Our lives apart from Jesus are dark. We're hopeless. And the light has come and the light dramatically changes everything. And you know what I love about what this passage says? Look at verse three. I don't know if you can put that up on the screen in the dark, but go ahead. Okay, put it up there. It says, 
thou hast multiplied the nation and not increased the joy? They joy before thee according to the joy and harvest, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. When the people in Galilee saw the light of Jesus and they saw what he was doing, all of a sudden they had joy again, and their joy increased. Just like at harvest, we don't live in an agricultural society. There are some farmers around this area, not many, but up in Jay there's some farmers. But can you imagine at the end of that long growing year and you get your harvest into the barns and they're overflowing and everything is safe, there's reason to rejoice because you know you're going to be taken care of for the next year. Or like dividing spoil after battle. Can you imagine an enemy army's like all got you surrounded and the fear, what's going to happen when we go to battle? And then all of a sudden the battle's over and you didn't just win, but you get to go collect all the spoils from that battle and God's providing you with. That's the kind of joy that Jesus wants to bring into our lives. So are you ready for the practical application? You can go ahead and turn the lights back on to normal. All right, here we go. Whoa, wow, that got a little, I didn't realize how dark it got there. My eyes were already adjusting. All right, practical application. I, I got to tell you something before I do this. For whatever reason, last week, I decided, I was feeling in the Christmas, I decided to come up with some rhymes to make the points memorable. And so this week, as I'm sitting there and I'm going through this message, I'm like, you know what? We need some more rhymes again. I mean, I don't ever want you just to come to church and not be able to leave and sink your teeth into something. I'm always trying to figure out ways to just make the truth of God's word memorable. So keep all of that in mind when I tell you not to miss the joy of yesterday. And here's the practical application. All right. Are you ready for this? This is deep, man. This is really good stuff. My doom went kaboom. That's as deep as you can get. Okay, I ran that by a few people, and they're like, that is so weird. And I was like, I know. Should I say it? And they're like, probably not, but it's really memorable. And that's the point that I, I want you to take away from. I'm not going to say it a lot because it just sounds strange to say over and over again. But I do want you to get that drilled into your head. My doom went kaboom. Now, here's the key. Go ahead and put Matthew 4, 17 up on the screen, okay? This is at the end of that prophecy that's being fulfilled. And Jesus begins his earthly ministry in Zebulun and Naphtali, in the, in, the, in the region of Galilee. And what's this verse says? It says, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say what? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The only way you can look at your past and find Jesus is if there's repentance that's what it's all about. You have to understand, we were living in darkness. We were going our own way, doing our own thing in complete rebellion to God. And then suddenly the light of Jesus appears. But just because the light of Jesus appears doesn't mean that it changes and affects your life unless you repent, unless there's a 180 degree turn and you say, I am done going my way. I'm going the Jesus way. I'm putting my faith and trust in him. And you know what? When you believe on Jesus, at the moment you believe, you know what happens? <laughs> Boom. You get saved. You become a brand new creation in Christ. Everything gets turned completely upside down. That's what happens when we believe in Jesus. Everything transforms. Everything changes. You know what's awesome? Look at verse 4 in this passage. Man, that light that shines in darkness. Look what it says in verse 4. For thou hast broken the what? Yoke of his burden and the what? Staff of his shoulder and the of his oppressor as in the day of Midian. You know what, God, God, God's just, he's going on and he's using example after example. He's saying, hey, God breaks the yoke. God breaks the staff. God breaks the rod. God breaks whatever it is in your life that is oppressing you. Whatever it is in your life that's causing darkness. Whatever it is that's in your life that's holding you back. You know what God wants to do? He wants to break it. And he wants to break it in a miraculous way. In a way that only God can do. Just like he did at Midian. You know what happened at Midian? How many of you have heard of a man by the name of Gideon? Gideon happened at Midian. I did not even mean that. I'm a poet and didn't even know it. Man, this is good. Getting extra rhymes in here today. Oh, that was an extra blessing. Thank you. No, anyway, <laughs> moving on. Gideon. God takes, they have the Midianites are coming in with an army of 120,000 people. The nation of Israel is vastly outnumbered. And you know what God does? He eliminates their army and erases it all the way down to 300 men. 
And he says, take your 300 men, surround the Midianite camp, and all I want you to take is a trumpet and a pitcher with a light. And when I give the command, you blow your trumpets as loud as you can, you break the lights, and that's what they did. This is how they fought the battle. They blew their trumpets, they broke their pitchers and the light shining, and they watched the Midianites in all of their confusion turn on each other, and that army of 120,000 killed each other, and the 300 people just sat up there and said, whoa, (laughs) I can't believe this is happening. That's how our God works. He doesn't need our strength and our might and our power because he's got it all and he steps in and he does incredible things like die on the cross and then rise again from the dead three days later. Do you understand that when you look at your past and you put your faith in Jesus, everything changes and everything changes for the good. And I love verse 5. I'm not going to read it. God doesn't just defeat the enemy. He annihilates them. It talks about how when it's all said and done and you clean up, you, you take the bloody clothes from war and you burn them in a fire. And it's not just the picture of defeat. It's the com- picture of complete annihilation, that enemy that was once there and so powerful and had such a hold in your life. They're gone. That's what our God does. I saw this quote this week. It was so good. It's about rumination. You know know what it means to ruminate? It means to just go over something over and over and over. It's like the idea of meditation. Just ruminate on something. It actually has the idea of like a cow chewing the cud. And that's what a cow does. I mean, it just just chews and chews, and you're like, would you hurry up and swallow that thing and move on? And it, it, it goes down, he swallows it, but then he regurgitates it, and he brings it back up, and he does this over and over and over again. That's the idea of rumination. You know what? I, the quote was this, rumination is wallowing a thousand times in what God wanted you to walk through one time. Again, true joy does not ignore that. We live in a sin-cursed world, right? And there's a lot of pain I know in this room. When you look to your past, there is sin. Man, how many of you wish you could go back and make some decisions over again and do some things differently? Hey, when you look in your past, there's probably betrayal. Maybe there's broken marriages. Maybe there's broken promises. Maybe, maybe some of your best friends or family members didn't understand and they turned your backs on you. All I'm saying is when we look at our past, there will be hurt. There will be pain. But there's also Jesus. And when Jesus breaks into the situation, he breaks us free from that rod of oppression. And he doesn't want us to walk through something over and over and over again. He wants us to be set free. And he wants us to look at the power of Jesus and the power of the light and take that to the past and say, no, it is done. It is forgiven. It is in my past. It is erased once and for all. And you know what he does? He completely annihilates the enemy where he can take even that pain and that hurt. And he can turn it around and use it for his glory. That's who our God is. Don't miss the wonder of yesterday. And if you're taking it seriously, understand that God did something about all that doom and gloom of your past. He blew it up with the gospel of Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross. Secondly, don't miss the joy of today. Don't miss the joy of today. Look at verse 6. Okay, you all are going to help me out with this, okay? For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called. Everybody help me read the end of the verse. Here we go. Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. You know what Isaiah 9, 6 is? It is the greatest birth announcement that has ever been announced in the history of the world for multiple reasons. One, it it was an announcement that came 700 years before Christ was born. How many of you would say that's a pretty impressive birth announcement right there? Looking 700 years, generations into the future, there's going to be a Savior that's born. Hey, it announced the birth of the King of all kings. You know what that verse says? That the government shall be upon his shoulder. You know all that glory that we were just talking about? Those that walk in darkness saw a great light? All of the hope for that glory rested upon the birth of this child. That's going to come 700 years later. And you know what? This birth announcement is different and it's special because the child is up for the challenge. And he's actually given four names here. How many of you think four names might be a little bit excessive? But he's given four different names here in this birth announcement. Wonderful counselor. Man, you can go further through Isaiah and you can see how he puts those two thoughts together over and over again. But he's a wonderful counselor. You know that God is all wise? You know what's pretty awesome about God? Has God ever come to you in your sleep and said, hey, I'm a little bit confused about what's happening and taking place in this world. 
I need some help. Could you give me some wisdom on this situation? Has God ever done that to any of you? If he has, you need to get some help. Okay, no, just kidding. Listen, God doesn't do that. He doesn't come to us. He's all wise. He's all knowing. And everything that he does is right. And everything that he does is good. And you know what's amazing about God? Is he wants to share that counsel with us. If any of you lack wisdom, that's me. That's you. Let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally and upbraideth not. I love what Proverbs 3, 6 says, In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. He's a wonderful counselor. He's the mighty God. He is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. You know how he created this world? With a word. He said, let there be light, and boom, there was light. That's the kind of power that we're talking about. He was dead in a grave, but the grave had no power to hold him. There's nothing that can limit the power of our God. How many of you need God's power and God's might to step into your present and to step into whatever situations you're faced with? Can I tell you, God's greater than any problem that you have. He's not sweating it. He's not worried about it. He's the mighty God. He's the everlasting Father. <laughs> when you believed at that moment of repentance and belief, you know what happened? Another way that we can say when we talk about getting saved is you got born again. You became a brand new creation in Christ. You were birthed into the family of God. He is the everlasting Father. There's never not going to be a day in your life where God doesn't care about you. This is beautiful. You ever just wish that somebody understood? Man, relationships can be messy sometimes, can't they? Sometimes you go to open up to people, people that are even close to you, and maybe they just don't fully grasp or understand what you're going through. You know who does? Your everlasting father. That's what he is. He cares about you. He cares about your situation. He wants you to cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. And then he's the prince of peace. And I love this idea right here. He brought peace to the world. Most importantly, peace with God. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that we were born dead in our trespasses and sins. We were without God, having no hope and without God in this world. There was a wall of division, and it's called sin between us and God. And you know what Jesus did on the cross? He died for our sins. He paid your sin penalty. And when we believe in him, God doesn't see us in all of our sin and brokenness. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that wall that separated us from that relationship with God was broken down by his death on the cross. And you know what's beautiful? When you experience peace with God, you can experience peace with yourself. And when you experience peace with yourself... You can experience peace with others. Can I tell you this morning that he is the prince of peace? Are you ready for practical application number two? Here we go. Shalom is where I roam. It's good stuff, man. I want you to look at the person next to you, and I want you to tell him shalom. We just did this a couple weeks ago when we were going through the book of Joel. Shalom. You know what? That, that has the idea of when you tell somebody that, you're telling somebody, hey, may you be full of well-being. May you be filled with the peace of God. Can I tell you what, what does God want for you? What does, God, does God want us to live our lives in anxiety and in worry? No, he wants us to live in peace. He wants us to experience the sense of wholeness and wellness that comes from him. He wants us to feel safe. He wants us to feel complete. That's the idea of shalom. That's, that's where I want to live my life. You know what's beautiful about those names? Jesus is wise, so he gives us counsel for our steps. He's all powerful, so he's able to, to intervene in whatever situations are holding us back. He's our everlasting father. He cares, and he's the prince of peace. He wants us to get up every single day and experience the peace of God that passes all understanding. Can I tell you where we get into trouble? We get into trouble when we predetermine how God should act or be. And by the way, we all do it. There's not a single 18-year-old high school student, I don't think, in, in this school anywhere, that would look at their future and say, all it's going to be is a tragedy and a wreck. Think back to your high school years. You know what you think? You just think that things are just naturally going to happen. I'm going to get married. I'm going to have kids. I'm going to have a job. I'm going to have a house. I'm going to have a family. You don't look at your future ahead and think that it's all going to be doom and gloom. You just think everything's going to just fall into place and take care of itself. But guess what happens as you start going through life? It doesn't always happen that way, does it? Sometimes we, we don't get married. Sometimes we experience tragedy. We lose our spouse. 
We have cancer. You lose your kids. Sometimes you go through horrific job situations and and very desperate financial situations. I mean, we live in a broken, sin-cursed world, don't we? The problem is when we predetermine and we say, God, this is how my life was supposed to be, and this is what I deserve to happen and take place in my life. And when we think that it all should fall into place like that, we are setting ourselves up for huge disappointment. Can I tell you this morning that your pain isn't evidence that God doesn't care? Your pain is evidence of how desperately we need God. We live in a sin-cursed world. We're rebels at heart. I mean, I'll, we are rebels at heart, are we not? And we, des- we don't deserve the good in life. But God, in his infinite grace and mercy, says, nevertheless, I'm going to step in and I'm going to intervene. And yes, you live in a broken world, but if you put your eyes on me, and if you look to me for my counsel, if you look to me for my strength, if you look to me for my love and the care that I can provide, then, man, I will give you a peace that passes all understanding, and you can live today. Knowing that your God's got it all under control. Shalom. The idea of peace and wholeness and safety. And here's the last thing I want us to understand this morning. Don't miss the joy of tomorrow. Don't miss the joy of tomorrow. Look at verse 7. It says, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. I love that he says, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Do you understand that that right now his government is increasing? Do you understand that you and I are part of God's plan to lift high the name of Jesus and to point people to the light of the world? And you know that, that even the gates of hell shall not withstand against the power of the gospel. The the gates of hell cannot hold back the truth of God's word going forward. Man, when we're obedient, there are people all around our world being saved today. There are people in Milton and Pace being saved today. I pray that somebody at the end of this service would put their faith and trust in Jesus today. His government is increasing. And there's coming a day, a day of all days, and what a day that will be where his government will be so pervasive That there are no pockets of rebellion at all. There's only justice and righteousness and joy and peace. That's what we have to look forward to when we think about the future. You know what's really cool about that verse? If you you got a pen or something to underline or highlight it, it says at the end of that verse that the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. You know that word zeal? It has to do with the idea of jealousy. You know what God's jealous for? God's jealous for the glory of his name. God is jealous that his truth and his worth and his beauty and his greatness would be seen, not because he's some egocentrical God that needs everybody's worship and love, but because he's a loving God, because the greatest need that we have in all the world is the need for him, and he wants to share himself with us. The zeal of the Lord, the jealousy of God for the fame of his name will ensure the fact that it's going to happen He's going to come back again. He's going to establish his throne. He's going to right every wrong. He's going to remove all wickedness. And those of us who have put our faith and trust in him, we will be in his presence where there's fullness of joy and pleasure forevermore. That's what we have to look forward to in the future. Can I tell you this morning that his peace will never cease? This peace will never cease. The wonder of joy. Hey, when we look in the past, we see joy. Man, when we look at our brokenness and our circumstances and the hurt and we see how Jesus steps in and transforms, we find joy. When we look at today, when you look at whatever problem that you're faced with, and again, you see Jesus and you see his power and you see his wisdom, there's joy. When you look into the future and you look at tomorrow and you don't understand how it's all going to end and how things are going to go, but you know what we do know? We do know how it's all going to end ultimately one day. It's going to end in his presence where there's no more sorrow and no more sickness and no more pain and no more crying. Oh, what a day that's going to be. Here's the conclusion of all of this. This ought to motivate us. What what are we going to do with the joy that God's given us? I brought just a candle here this morning. I want to just light this. If you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, 
your candle doesn't get snuffed out. <laughs> it stays burning. I need to not, I mean, I walk too fast and I talk too much. <laughs> but I, I just want you to think about this. When you got saved, you got the light of Jesus. What does he want us to do with this light? Hey, does he want us to just come to church and we worship this morning and then, man, it's the Christmas. We just go back home and we go to our families and we enjoy all God's blessings, but we just kind of keep it to ourselves. It's kind of the idea of like us four and no more. By the way, that, I bring that up because that's something as human beings that we have to recognize and we have to identify and we have to fight against. It's really easy for us just to want to kind of go into our own homes and our own lives and not always to engage or not always to live on mission, but the wonder of joy, God's given us something incredible and he didn't give it to us so that we hide it under a bushel. That's what he talks about in Matthew chapter five. He says, no, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. Hey, right now during this Christmas season, it's not time for us just to retreat into our own homes and into our own lives. It's time for us to spread the joy of what it's all about. There are people who are sitting in darkness. And you know what we can do? We can invite them to church. We can invite them to the kids' Christmas program that we have coming up next week. We can invite them to baptism Sunday. We can pray that people will get saved and that lives will be transformed. We can invite them to the candlelight service. There's all kinds of opportunities that we have through the month of December to let the light of Jesus shine and to invite people and to point people to Jesus. We can share our testimonies about what God's done in our lives. You know what's... I know it's Christmas, and man, I know we're just absorbed with that. I am absorbed with that. It's busy, but on your way in this morning, how many of you had one of these little squares sitting on your seat? Guess what's coming in January? <laughs> we're adding a third service in January. I can't move. Why are we adding a third service in January? Because there's people that need the good news of Jesus. For whatever reason, God's blessing our church. We're being faithful to his word. His name's being lifted on high and he's drawing people to himself almost every week. They, listen, I wish you all could come to staff meeting with us on Monday morning and you could hear the stories about the people that are visiting and the work that God's doing in people's lives. You, you see the baptisms that we've had and you've heard some of the testimonies in the story. Every single person, we're not just trying to add a service because we just want to be this big, massive church. No, we're adding a service because there are people who are sitting in darkness and we have the light. And they're coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus and they're individuals and their lives are being transformed and changed in mind-blowing and unbelievable ways, just like yours was. They're repenting and believing the truth of the gospel. How can we not do more with the gospel of Jesus Christ? How can we not live on mission? How can we not be focused not on ourselves, but on our neighbors and our coworkers and our family members and the people that God's put in our lives? How can we not get on our knees and say, God, you've blessed me and you've given me so much. Thank you that I saw the light. Thank you that I put my faith and trust in you. Thank you for the way you've transformed and changed everything. Oh God, pray for my neighbor. I've gotten to know them, and I know they need Jesus. Pray for that person I go to work with every day. We're burdened. That's what we do with the wonder of joy. We let it transform our lives, and then we take it, and we share it, and we show it to a world that's in desperate need of it.